can't see anything. Damn, we're off course. No, I can't see it. We're way off. On June the 1st, 1999, as an American Airlines jet prepared to land amid fierce thunderstorms, passengers knew they were flying into trouble. I don't know what made me aware, so doggone aware, that we were going to have a problem. Oh, no! Within minutes, their worst fears would be realized. Other one! Other one! Other one! Other one! Other one! Other one! I'm yelling, get away from the plane. Run. Get away from the plane. I don't know where we're at, but there's a road that goes around the airport. Well, we got a lot of people hurt. This film tells the story of a tragic and avoidable disaster. The investigation would reveal a lethal combination of pilot error, the devastating effects of severe weather, and a dangerous race to keep the plane on schedule. It would also uncover disturbing evidence of an industry-wide failing, one that could kill again at any time. Despite reliable aircraft and extensive training, modern airlines and their crews face unprecedented pressures. Intense industry competition demands that the whole system, from the flight planners to the pilots, be efficient and on time. The stresses this can bring would play a vital role in the loss of Flight 1420. For a large operator like American Airlines, the pressures start with the complex task of scheduling their vast fleet. Dispatchers direct the planes around the world in a carefully choreographed dance. The strain of maintaining this efficiency affects the entire system. Of course, competition has become very intense, a lot of pressure on the dispatchers, pilots, flight attendants, and basically the whole infrastructure to accomplish the mission and make a dollar. Every effort is made to ensure that nothing disrupts these fragile schedules. But there is one variable that no airline can control, the weather. The southern states of America are especially prone to severe weather. Storms not only cause delays, but pose extreme dangers to commercial jets. Delays, scheduling problems and fierce thunderstorms would all conspire to turn a routine flight into a terrifying race against time. On June 1, 1999, American Airlines Flight 1420 is running late. The movement of the storms. Everything is sliding to the southeast. So yes, we do have a stormy evening headed our way. The delay of Flight 1420 put pressure on the pilots even before takeoff. The responsibility can fall on flight crews to keep a tight schedule on track. Dispatch, please. Yeah, it's Michael Oregon. Crews have strict legal limits on their duty time. The first officer warned the dispatcher that they were in danger of running out of time. The flight had to take off in the next hour or be cancelled. The pilots also became aware of another pressure caused by deteriorating weather near their destination. The pilots had a weather briefing that they got before they departed Dallas-Fort Worth which provided the forecast the weather alerts, the dispatcher and the captain preparing for the flight uh, looked at the weather information and thought they could get to Little Rock before the thunderstorms impacted. The 139 passengers just wanted to get home. I was traveling with my son and my daughter. We were coming home from our vacation. It was my daughter's first flight. The plane was late and there were a lot of delays, of course. It was tiring, it was frustrating, it was late at night. They soon began to sense that Flight 1420 was racing against the weather. As they called for us to board the plane, they wanted us there and just to get on really quickly. Just get on, sit down, put your seatbelt on, we're going. 
They did mention that there was bad weather between us and Little Rock. They wanted to get ahead of the bad weather coming into Little Rock. Finally, over two hours behind schedule, Flight 1420 leaves Dallas. Unknown to the crew, the storms are already massing around Little Rock. 40 minutes later, 1420 is 100 miles from its destination. At this point, the voice recorder transcript reveals a calm and steady cockpit routine. So far, it's okay. So far, so good, ma'am. American 1420 will let you know. The first officer on American 1420 was a new hire. He had just recently completed training, and he had been paired on one of his first trips with this management captain. So now you had a very experienced pilot sitting in the left seat with the company, paired with a relatively new hire. Bushman and Oregon are clearly relaxed as they plan their approach and landing. 25 for 24, set and armed. I think this stuff's gonna work out pretty well. Yeah, we're almost down to max landing weight. Uh, there's a moon out. Or a spaceship. Oh, it's the mothership. Center pump's coming off. All right. The pilots are keeping a close eye on the storms ahead. Onboard weather radar scans a cone-shaped area of sky in front of the plane. Potentially severe storms show up in red. There's your big wad diddly. Yeah, we gotta get over there real quick. I don't like that. That's lightning. Sure is. The American Airlines dispatcher issued an update on the shape and formation of the thunderstorms. Right now on radar, there's a large slot to Little Rock. Thunderstorms are on the left and right, and Little Rock is in the clear, sort of like a bowling alley approach. Thunderstorms are moving east, north, eastward towards Little Rock, and they may be a factor for our arrival. I suggest expediting our arrival. The dispatcher gave this flight crew the weather information. It appeared to him that there was going to be a gap or a, what he called the bowling alley, where you had two types of thunderstorms or two thunderstorms with an alley between it. And that the flight crew, if they had expedited their travel to Little Rock, could probably make it up that alley be before the, the two storms closed together. But as flight 1420 descends, the plan to beat the storms is about to go seriously wrong. The pilots do not realize that the walls of the bowling alley are closing in. The route flown by American Airlines Flight 1420 is flanked by treacherous thunderstorms, a corridor the pilots call the Bowling Alley. With 80 miles to go, the path to Little Rock still appears to be clear. This is the Bowling Alley right here. Yeah, I know. In fact, there are the city lights. Straight there. You want to go down? Not yet, but pretty soon. Uh, we're about 80 miles uh, from the airport, and we started our descent uh, toward it. Quite a light show on the side of the aircraft, and we're going to be passing that on our way to Little Rock. Uh, it's been a pleasure having you aboard our short flight, and I'd like to take this opportunity to thank you for flying American Airlines. The lightning seemed to be on both sides of the plane. It lit up the inside of the plane. Very quick, you know, just... Kaboom type <laughs> lightning, which was a little scary. There was quite a light show off to the left. Normally that doesn't get pointed out. If you go past the Grand Canyon, that gets pointed out, but not a lightning show. As the plane descends, transcripts of the cockpit voice recordings show that the pilots are aware of rough weather ahead. Descent check's complete. We gotta get there quick. Yep. Sit him down early. Hello? I think it's gonna get a little bumpy here again, uh, if you don't mind. Uh, 
Do we need to sit down? Uh, well, how far through are you? Um, we're almost done, but not quite. Well, finish it up real quick. Okay. I thought it was more turbulent than normal. I remember especially watching the flight attendant, and I was looking at her with amazement. I was wondering how could she hold those trays and pour the drinks and, and not spill everything. From that point, you know, it just got worse. With flaps 40, 130,000 pounds, 200 feet. As they prepare for landing, the pressure on the pilots will now steadily rack up. Not required. Manual brakes? Uh, manual's fine. At first, as the crew pick their way around the storms, everything seems steady. Yeah, actually, there's a city right there. Yeah. Breaking through this crowd. Good. Doing good. Even when the first indication comes that the storms are advancing, the pilots take it in their stride. Whoa. Looks like it's moving this way, though. Yeah. Just some lightning. Straight ahead. I think we're gonna be okay, though. Right there. Yep. Right down the bowling alley. As my friends would say, California cool. Cool. Peachy. Exactly. 1420 at 11.3 for 10,000. But when the pilots contact the controller at Little Rock, he gives the first of a series of alarming weather alerts. Roger. Uh, we've got a thunderstorm just northwest of the airport moving through the area now. Uh, wind is 280 at 28 gusts 44, and uh, I'll have new weather for you in just a moment, I'm sure. Gale force winds are gusting to 50 miles per hour, enough to blow tiles off a rooftop. High winds pose a severe hazard for Flight 1420. Crosswinds could make it difficult to control the plane on landing. The pilots must quickly determine if they're within safe limits. They calculate the strength of the crosswind from its angle to their final approach. All right, so that's uh, 280 at 44. Uh, gusts at 44. Right, near the limit. Well, it's 40 degrees off. I mean, you're not out of the limit because of the angle, but, but, but that's pretty close. The crosswind limit for landing is 30 knots on a dry runway, but Bushman and Oregle now become confused about what happens if it rains. Well, 30 knots is the crosswind limitation, but see, 30 knots... That's well, dry. Wet. Yeah, dry. What's the wet? 20. It's 25. The discussion is never resolved and the crosswinds will soon be gusting well over the limit. Flight attendants, uh, prepare for landing, please. The pilot's attention now returns to the bad weather ahead. He said the storm was to the northwest of the field? He said northwest. Yeah. Lightning strike, he said storm. But the task of tracking the storms is made more difficult by the lack of sophisticated radar at Little Rock. Uh, American 1420, um, your equipment's a lot better than uh, what I have. How's that final for 22 left looking? What's that? Uh, we can see the airport, but uh, we can just barely make it out. Uh, we should be able to make 22. That storm is moving closer, like your radar says. But it's a little farther off than you thought. The controllers are going, well, your radar is, is better than mine, so forth. The controller in this accident had a monochromatic or basically almost a black and white set of a radar and could not determine the intensities of the storm. Just eight miles from the airport, the pilots now face another key decision. How to approach the runway through bad weather. Controllers routinely ask pilots if they want to land visually instead of relying on the airport's electronic instrument landing system or ILS but a visual approach means they must be able to see the runway. And this is proving difficult. Uh, no, we can't really make it out right now. Uh, we're gonna have to stay with you as long as possible. Now, as the wind suddenly changes direction, the pilot's problems quickly mount up. Uh, the wind's kinda kicked around a little bit right now. It's 330 at 1-1. Whoa, it's a little better than it was. Yet 330 is tailwind though. The crew now face the problem of having the wind behind them when they land, greatly increasing the dangers of overshooting the runway. Then the controller calls in with more bad news. 
Uh, right now I have a wind shear alert. Wind shear is a sudden change of wind direction over a short distance. It is one of the most feared elements of a severe thunderstorm. To combat constantly shifting winds, the pilots are forced to throw away their previous approach plans and start again. They have to reverse the direction of their approach, so they will be landing into the wind. Yeah, we're going to need, uh, or... We would rather go into the headwind, sir. The pilot's decision to land in the opposite direction is a prudent move, but it will create serious problems. Okay, a right turn 250. The long way around? Uh, yes, sir. You're a little close to the airport. Yeah, right. 250, that'll work. As the pilots turn to their new approach, the aircraft's weather radar, which scans in front of the plane, loses track of the thunderstorms. Worse still, the turn delays landing by more than 10 minutes. And with every passing moment, the storms are growing in intensity. Runway 4 right, 111.3042. I think, uh, I think that was the airport below us. Yeah, right, okay. Switching uh, runways, three, keeping track of the storms, all add greatly to the pilot's heavy workload. Okay, 2217, glide slope, intercept all the way down. Missed approach, right turn to 4,000. Uh, let's see, you got the airport, right? So yeah, I don't have the airport. Well, I'm, I'm saying you've got the ILS. Yeah, I got the ILS. Airline pilots, they make their money when they're flying into bad weather. When the weather goes down, now all of a sudden, the workload starts to increase because you have to factor in low clouds, rain, lightning, thunderstorms, wind, all of these elements start to bombard you the closer you get into the airport environment. American 1420, it appears we have a second part of this storm moving through. The wind now is 340 at 16 gust 34. With the storms worsening, the pilots need to make it to the airport as quickly as possible. You want to accept the short approach, keep it tight? Yeah, but if you can see the runway, because I, I don't quite see it. Uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's right there. All right, you see it? You just point me in the right direction, I'll start slowing down. Give me flaps 11. Damn, it's heading right over the field. American 1420, did you call me? Uh, yeah, uh, we got the airport, but we're going right in between clouds. Um, I, I think it's to my right, uh, off my 3 o'clock low, about uh, 4 miles. American 1420, that's it. Do you uh, want to shoot the visual approach or you want to go out for the ILS? A visual approach will allow 1420 to reach the airport faster than one that depends on instruments. Uh, well, yeah, uh, I can start the visual uh, if we can do it. American 1420's cleared visual approach, runway 4 right. If you lose it, need some help, let me know, please. But a visual approach means the pilots must keep the runway in sight at all times. The transcripts now reveal rising confusion on the flight deck as the captain struggles to fix the position of the airport. Okay, did you notice something? Did you see the airport there? Where? There, okay. Right. You're on a base for it, okay? It's it's right there. Well, I'm on a base now? It's it's like a dog leg. We're coming in, and, and, and there it is, right there. Uh, I lost it. it. You're downwind of it. it it's, it's, right, it's right there. Well, I, I still don't see it. <laughs> Uh, just vector me, I, I don't know. American 1420, monitor 118.7, runway 4 right, clear to land. The wind now, 330 at 2-1. 18-7 will monitor, American 1420, thanks. Uh, clear to land, runway 4. You see, if, see if those red lights there, now, uh, what are they in relation to? There's the runway. Uh, there's two runways. Yeah, I know. <sighs> see, we're losing it. I don't see how we can maintain visual. The pilots now have to abandon their direct visual approach and request help from Little Rock's instrument landing system. But this delays landing even further. Approach, American 1420. American 1420, yes, sir. Yeah, there's a cloud between us and the airport, uh, and we've lost the field. Um, we're on a vector. Uh, well, basically we're on the last vector you gave us. Uh, which is like a dog leg, it looks like. Uh, American uh, 1420, can you fly heading 220? I'll take you out for the ILS. This news footage shows the storm on the night of the crash. 
As heavy rain cuts visibility even further, Captain Bushman becomes frustrated. See, I, I hate droning around visual at night and weather without having any clue where we are. The thing that was really getting to me was I knew we were getting very low. I knew that the rain was not letting up and that we were being uh, jolted around quite heavily. See how we're going right in the middle of this crap, right? Approach American 1420. I know you're doing your best, sir, but uh, we're getting really close to this storm and uh, we'll keep it really tight if we have to. The plane was rocking and rolling at that point. It was pretty doggone unstable. I don't know what made me aware, so doggone aware, that we were going to have a problem. I don't know what did that. As Flight 1420 lines up for final approach, they are heading straight into the heart of the thunderstorm. The crisis for the flight crew is about to get even worse. With Flight 1420 four minutes from touchdown, severe thunderstorms give the pilots another major problem. Blinding rain and thick cloud are obscuring the airfield. The visibility on the runway, known as RVR, is getting dangerously low. Oh, we're going right into this. Uh, American 1420, right now we have heavy rain on the airport. Uh, I don't have new weather for you, but uh, visibility is less than a mile. And the runway 4 right RVR is 3,000. Visibility is down to 3,000 feet. The pilots are unsure if it's safe to land. 3,000? Roger that, 3,000, American 1420. This is 4 right, correct? American 1420, that's correct, sir. And runway 4 right, clear to land. The wind's now 350 at 30 gusts 45. Can we land? 030 zero, zero at 45, American 1420. 3000 RVR, we can't land on that. No, 3000 if you What do we at, need? No, it's 2400 RVR. Okay, right. Yeah, we're fine. All right. Uh, 15. Landing gear down. And lights, please. As we descended, we descended through a very dark black cloud. The rain seemed to be going horizontal. It was windy enough, apparently outdoors, that the, the, the plane was moving around a lot. I'd never done this before. I buckled up really tight, almost uncomfortably tight, and I was concerned enough. I put my shoes back on and got ready to go. There was something going on that made me very nervous. The crosswinds are way over the limit. The pilots could divert to another airport, but they don't, even as the weather gets worse. Wind shear alert, uh, center field wind 350 at 32 gusts 45, north boundary wind 310 at 29, northeast boundary wind 320 at 32. The jolts seem to be much stronger than I'd ever felt. You could tell that the Thunderheads were extremely close to the plane. I said words to the effect that if, if he tries to land in this weather, we'll crash. Flaps 28. Add 20. Then visibility falls drastically below the limit. American 1420, the runway 4 right RVR is now 1,600. Damn! The crew are rattled. Under pressure, they begin to make mistakes. I can't see anything. Looking for a 460. It's there couldn't see anything. The wind was throwing the plane around so violently. I think it was enough of a crosswind that I was afraid we were going to land on the wing. We felt like we were going to tip over. I mean, it just felt that bad. You want 40 flaps? Yeah, I thought I called it. I knew the way he was jockeying the plane and the sounds of the engines that he was trying to get lined up for the runway. And I couldn't see it, and I couldn't see it. But I could tell we were close. And I kept thinking, where's the runway? 1,000 feet. 20. 40-40 land. This, this is a can of worms. Wind is 330 at 2-8. I'm going to stay above it a little. There's a runway off to your right. You got it? No. I got the runway in sight. You're right on course. I got it. Stay where I you got are. it. I got it. Most of the people at that point in the plane were just holding on really tight, just looking forward. I mean, it, like rigid. I suspected the worst. I mean, I really did. We might not get down. In 
the midst of fierce thunderstorms. Flight 1420 is about to land at Little Rock. Low visibility and high winds make the final approach treacherous. Wind 330 at 25. 500 feet, plus 20. Wind 330 at 23. Damn, we're off course. No, I can't see it. Way off. I can't see anything. Got it? Got it! 100 feet. 50 feet. 40. 30. 20. 10. hit the runway real hard. We didn't slow down. We're down! We're sliding! Oh no! We were still going very, very, very fast. And at that point, I thought, we're dead. On the brakes! <laughs> it was just chaos. It was terrifying. It, it was quite literally terrifying. Other one! Other one, other one! The plane actually stopped. There was a moment of absolute, total silence. There was fire in front of me and I could see debris and it was silent. And I thought, oh my gosh, I'm dead. Well, I knew we were in deep trouble. You know, it's a process that started, and in some way it's got to end, it's going to end, and when it ends, how do I get out of here? Within those minutes, I heard a small scream, and I heard it get louder and louder and louder, like it was on a megaphone. And it hit me, that's my daughter. And it's like, oh, okay, we've, we've got to get out of here. You know, we've got to do something. The passengers struggled to get out before fire engulfed the cabin. I had a broken scapula, dislocated shoulder, and uh, cracked ribs, and all sorts of stuff going on, but I didn't feel a thing. I just wanted to get out. I was not going to die in that thing. I got out of that plane probably in 10 seconds. It's like being in war. Go, go, go! I'm yelling, get away from the plane. Run. Get away from the plane. Go. Go, go. Some folks looked like they'd been in an explosion. Their clothes were tattered. I saw a man using his cell phone to call for help. Okay, I don't know where we're at, but there's a road that goes around the airport. Well, we've got a lot of people hurt. Traveling at over 100 miles an hour, the aircraft ran off the end of the runway, plowed down a 25-foot embankment, and slammed into a steel walkway. The plane was ripped into several pieces. The wreckage finally came to rest on the muddy banks of the Arkansas River. Ten passengers died in the crash. Captain Bushman was killed instantly when the cockpit was split open by the steel walkway. It was a shame I hadn't, literally a shame that I had not done more to save people. That's the worst nightmare I have. The U.S. National Transportation Safety Board was immediately notified. Greg Fife was the NTSB's chief investigator. The night American 1420 happened, I received a phone call about 1 o'clock in the morning 
from our communications center at the NTSB advising that there had been an aircraft accident at Little Rock and there may be some fatalities involved. Fellow investigator Don Ike was quickly on the scene. There's a sense of adrenaline as an accident occurs like this where you're being launched to the accident scene. And there's a strong urge to get there, to try to find out what happened, to document the facts so we can prevent it from happening. The NTSB set up a command center close to the site. They would spend the next 18 months piecing together the events that led to the crash. We did have a basic idea when we got on scene of what had happened. We just didn't know why. We knew the airplane went off the end of the runway. We knew that the pilots couldn't stop it. We knew that the aircraft was destroyed going through this catwalk. We knew that the subsequent post-crash fire killed people. We just didn't know why at that point. The NTSB worked backwards from the impact, piecing together the sequence of events from the final approach all the way back to Dallas-Fort Worth. The first question for investigators was why the pilots had been unable to stop the plane. Analysis of the tire tracks left by the skidding plane showed a complete loss of control after touchdown. When you look at the width of those tire tracks, you'd then see that the airplane wasn't going straight, but in fact was sliding sideways. Here you have this machine that weighs 130, 140,000 pounds. It has 100 or so people on it. It is sliding uncontrolled off this runway. Something had gone terribly wrong on landing, and investigators had to find out why. They questioned the survivors of Flight 1420, who would provide an extremely important clue. The NTSB investigators needed to find out why Flight 1420 had slid uncontrolled off the runway. They set out to interview surviving passengers, many of whom were local to Little Rock. Their eyewitness testimony would point the inquiry towards the most important mechanical system used to slow a plane down after landing. We were really interested in were those passengers that were sitting in a position right near the wings who could look out the windows and tell us whether they saw the ground spoilers deploy. Spoilers are large flaps that flip up on landing, literally spoiling the airflow over the wings. This prevents them from giving lift and allows braking to take effect. Crucially, none of the passengers saw the spoilers deploy. To check their testimony, the NTSB examined information from the airplane's black boxes. The flight data recorder, which monitors the systems on board during flight, confirmed that the spoilers had failed to deploy. The implications were catastrophic. Flight 1420 had no hope of stopping in time. On the brakes! We're sliding! Oh no! So was the failure of the spoilers to deploy a mechanical problem? Or in the confusion of final approach, was it pilot error? To find out, the NTSB would make clever use of the cockpit voice recorder, or CVR. You want 40 flaps? Yeah, I thought I called it. One of the key elements that the CVR team was listening for was the setting of the spoiler handle. We saw on the flight data recorder that the ground spoilers didn't deploy. We wanted to know if the handle had been actually armed or not, and we were looking for a specific click sound. We couldn't find that sound on the accident CVR, which led us to believe that the handle was never in the armed position at touchdown. Intensely busy in the cockpit, the pilot simply forgot to arm the spoilers. Had they deployed, the MD-80 aircraft might have overshot the runway, but it would have stopped before hitting the catwalk. The pilots had made serious and ultimately fatal errors, but investigators wanted to know why. They suspected that pressures earlier in the flight led to these mistakes. They turned their attention to the weather. It was 
clear to us that severe weather had been in the area around the time of the accident. How it played a part was one of the things we had to try to discover. And putting the radar images in, the observations, trying to put it all together, would take weeks, of course, to get this information done. The NTSB wanted to know what role the weather had played in the crash, and had the pilots been fully aware of the dangers. See how we're going right in the middle of this crap. One of the concerns that all pilots have when they're trying to land an aircraft is, of course, making sure that the crosswinds that they may experience don't exceed the capabilities of either themselves or the aircraft. The wind's now 350 at 30 gusts 45. Can we land? This particular flight crew had a limitation, not imposed by themselves, but imposed by the company and that was that they were not allowed to exceed a 10-knot crosswind on a wet runway. Crosswind limits are clearly stated in the operating manual. The crew of 1420 were flying beyond regulation limits. This, this is a can of worms. There's a runway off to your right. You got it? No. The effect of the winds can be seen in this NTSB animation showing the captain's desperate last maneuvers. Winds definitely impacted the flight. If you look at the animation, you'll see him fighting the winds. Definitely not good. If we're down! On the brakes! Other one, other one! But when you start talking about a wet runway, thunderstorms, not a good. But were the pilots of 1420 aware of the hazards posed by the severe weather? For the NTSB, Previous accidents had made the dangers of thunderstorms all too clear. In 1994, a US Air DC-9 fell victim to wind shear in North Carolina. The plane stalled at 250 feet and fell from the sky. A Delta TriStar crashed after flying into the most severe kind of wind shear that created an intense downdraft of air. So should the crew of 1420 have aborted the approach? There's the runway. Uh, there's two runways. Yeah, I know. See, we're losing it. I, I don't see how we can maintain visual. This NTSB weather animation overlays the path of the aircraft with ground radar images of the storm. Bushman and Oregle landed in lightning, torrential rain and hail, and the crosswinds gusting well over the limit. Based on the information that we had from ground-based weather radar, the flight crew of 1420 should have been seeing the majority of that storm. They would have been seeing the leading edge going green, rapidly changing the yellow to bright red. I can't see anything. Looking for a 460. As they progressed towards Little Rock, they started to paint the bad weather, not only on their onboard radar, but they could see out the window lightning. And one of the key statements that this captain made which basically summarized the entire flight was the captain saying I hate droning around visual at night and weather without having any clue where we are I hate droning around at night when I don't know where I am that was such a key statement it was at that point by an experienced 10,000 hour captain that he should have abandoned the approach going into Little Rock and either gone to his alternate or made his way back to Dallas. But to make a statement like that and then continue an approach to an airport where you have a thunderstorm in progress over the airport is a recipe for disaster. But the pilots were not the only ones to be heavily criticized. As the investigation continued, American Airlines flight policy would come under fire and an industry-wide scandal was about to be exposed. For months after the crash of Flight 1420, the NTSB dug deeper into the circumstances surrounding the accident. The question was, who would take responsibility? American Airlines were reluctant to admit that their pilots had knowingly flown into a severe thunderstorm. Initially, they tried to pin the blame on the controller at Little Rock. Americans started legal action against the authorities responsible for airport controllers. Americans' lawyers claim that the crew of Flight 1420 had not been given all the current weather information. Uh, American 1420, um, your equipment's a lot better than uh, what I have. 
How's that final for 2 2 left, Luke? But after interviewing the controller at Little Rock, investigators were unconvinced. It's highly unlikely that the flight crew wasn't sufficiently informed about the nature of the weather and the severity of the weather, not only en route, but of course, during the course of the landing at Little Rock. The focus turned back on the pilots. Lawyers representing the passengers were determined to get American Airlines to accept liability for the crash. I mean, it is about money in a way, because you want to make them pay. Because I saw the letters that they would write back to my lawyer, minimizing what we had been through, minimizing my daughter's burns, cuts, the psychological effects it had on my son at age 15, uh, and my daughter, and me, and just minimizing everything. So you want to find a way to hurt him. Rene Salmons and many other survivors attended the NTSB public hearings held in Little Rock eight months after the disaster. With the captain dead, the co-pilot was the first to testify. As we went off the end of the runway, I could see the runway lights coming up and I knew we were going off the end of the runway. I, I couldn't see anything in front of us. and All I thought was the gear would collapse and we would continue to slide. It's got to be okay. And then all of a sudden, I felt the impact. Well, I followed it as close as I could. <laughs> you bet. I mean, I wanted to know what happened. I went to all of the NTSB hearings. I was outraged. I was mad. For me, they didn't ask him the right questions. You know, I wanted to ask him, what were you thinking? Why did you all play chicken with our lives? The co-pilot's testimony was highly controversial. In his account of the final moments of the flight, he claimed to have told the captain to abort the approach, otherwise known as a go-around. Who can call for abandoning the approach? Uh, either pilot. Did you call for a go-around at any time? Uh, yes, sir, I did. It sounds like after reviewing the tape, you can definitely hear the go and the around. It seems like he talked the same time I did, and I looked over at him, and he, was, he brought the airplane back on course. However, when NTSB specialists studied the cockpit voice tapes, they couldn't hear this statement. Damn, we're off course. No, I can't see it. We're way off. Even though he stood by that statement, we could never validate it. That led to a controversial finding because we weren't really sure if that, that took place or not. The NTSB asked tough questions of the co-pilot, but was American Airlines training also at fault? Greg Fyth put an American Airlines manager on the stand. What were the company rules for pilots flying near thunderstorms? When asked the question, he basically responded that he just didn't want his pilots flying into that type of weather. Our pilots are forbidden to enter or depart a terminal area blanketed by thunderstorms. To the NTSB, this policy simply wasn't clear-cut enough. Well, that's a very subjective call for a pilot. Pilots need boundaries. You have to set limits. If there's convective activity, that is thunderstorm activity, it's within five nautical miles of the airport, there's lightning, there's wind shear, don't go there. The deeper they looked, the more the NTSB found that flying into thunderstorms was disturbingly widespread. Extraordinary evidence given at the hearings revealed that the problem spread through the whole industry. Expert analysts from MIT spent weeks recording the flight paths of planes landing at Dallas-Fort Worth. They waited for thunderstorms and watched how pilots reacted. Their animation plots the planes coming into land, overlaid with radar images of the storms. Anything yellow or orange is a potentially severe thunderstorm. Of the 2,000 encounters with thunderstorms, two out of three pilots flew into the storm and landed their aircraft. I was very surprised by the testimony at the public hearing, given the fact that they're flying the best equipment, typically have the best training, have the best information available to them. For those decisions to be made to continue into harm's way, it was very surprising to me that they tried to do that. Pilots know 
that if we go into that thunderstorm, we may not come out of that thunderstorm. And if we do, it may not be basically in one piece. Why did so many pilots fly into danger? The MIT researchers found pilots were more reckless if they were behind schedule, if it was night, and if aircraft in front of them were also flying into bad weather. In the Little Rock case, two of those three elements were present. It was night, and they were running late. The MIT investigation was chilling evidence that the crash at Little Rock was part of a much wider problem. We're not seeing a major improvement, put it bluntly. There's a uh, limited time for training. Weather was a significant part that set up the stage of this accident. We do not condone any operation to be uh, conducted in such weather. It is a known severe weather hazard and it should have been suspended, no operation. Ironically, it also emerged that new technology may be partly to blame for bad decision making. Might it be we're desensitizing pilots. We're putting weather radar on board aircraft. We're putting wind shear detection systems on airplanes. Most of these systems only react when you're in the hazard. That time, it may be too late. But the root causes behind the crash of 1420 went even deeper. Why were the pilots so determined to land? Greg Fife found the answer back at Dallas-Fort Worth, before the flight even left the ground. There, he found signs of a deadly condition in aviation, known as get their -itis there may have been a sense of get their itis. The flight crew knew that they were pushing their 14-hour duty day. It had been a long duty day. The airport's right there. Let's try it. Let's see if we can accomplish the mission. Pilots are goal-oriented. We're mission-oriented. We will stick our nose in there to try and see if we can accomplish the mission. Sometimes we will accomplish that mission, but sometimes we get too far into it that we can't bail out. We don't have any more options, and bad things happen. For Flight 1420, the pressures of Get Their Itis sparked a fatal series of mistakes and misjudgments. At the end of a long day, rushing to beat the storms and get the passengers to their destination, the crew of Flight 1420 made the basic mistake that cost 11 people their lives. They forgot to arm the spoilers. They were so busy trying to get the plane on the ground that they forgot to do what they needed to do. They didn't have time to do it. After the accident, American Airlines revised their checklist procedures. Both pilots must now confirm that the spoilers are armed, ready for landing. In October 2001, the NTSB published their report. They concluded that the two main causes of the crash were first, the decision to land in a thunderstorm, and second, the pilot's failure to arm the spoilers. American Airlines declined to take part in this film, or comment on the findings. As an investigator, I had over two years to basically criticize and determine what the captain was trying to accomplish. That particular captain had seconds to make decisions based on the information he was getting. And while it's unfair for an axe investigator like myself to start pointing the finger, I wasn't there. I blame them, but I'm not angry, per se, at them. I don't waste my time with anger on them. They'd got nothing but black. You can understand it, uh, but I can't understand a person, you know, wanting to kill himself either. We've been out and visited his grave at the Air Force Academy a couple, three times, and. The guy just got caught up in a bad, bad situation. I mean, uh, been there, done that. One year after the crash, the survivors of Flight 1420 gathered at the site to remember those who died. For surviving passengers, the effects of the crash are long-lasting and profound. as a family worked long and hard to work through it. We had 
many talks. It blew apart a lot of relationships. Uh, you find out who your real friends are. I cannot do enough to mitigate what happened to the individuals on an airplane. Life is a precious thing, and it, and you're definitely um, here for a very short time. Uh, you know, all of a sudden, your life looks like about a second and a half long. The impact of the crash is something that I try to block out of my mind because I still feel uh, a reaction. People ask me if I'm okay. Well, no, I'm not okay. No, we'll never be okay. I mean, what is this okay stuff? You're different. And deal with it. I mean, that's the way we're going to be. The day after um, it happened, when Adam and I were in the hospital in Samantha, um, Adam and I got up and we looked out the window and we just couldn't believe that life went on. We just couldn't believe cars were driving and it was sunny and life went on. You know, because for us, life stopped.